The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Oh, I'd like to get my hands on that cup that got me through the shoulder last night. Too bad it was through the shoulder, Mr. Crane. It should have been through your heart. You know, I like you. I like my women with a lot of spirit. I may just take you with me when I make my break from here. You'll have to kill me first. Oh, company. Come in and keep your hands right on that tray. I'd hate to have to shoot a beautiful girl like you. I brought up some coffee. That's thoughtful of you. Keep your hands in the air and stay away from me. Don't take any chances, Sandra. The Swede would rather shoot you than not. Rogue speaking. That little scene takes me back to a night a couple of months ago. The night I met some scared people in a seaside mansion. In just a minute, I'm going to tell you the story of the House of Fear. But first, here's Jim Doyle. Just talking about a grand product like Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream isn't really enough. We can tell you what a cool, solid comfort shave it gives, but you won't really know what this comfort is until you use Fitch's No Brush. The very instant you spread this rich, smooth cream on your face, you can tell the difference. You see, it contains a special skin conditioner ingredient that immediately lubricates your skin. Even men with super-sensitive skin find that the skin conditioner ingredient keeps their faces from feeling irritated. Then, when you start to shave, you'll find how easily your razor glides along, even against the grain of a tough beard. After you've finished... Your face will feel cool and refreshed, and you'll know what we mean when we say Fitch's No Brush gives a solid comfort shave. You men who prefer a lather cream will like Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives an abundant, dense lather that stays moist all during the shave. It doesn't become dry and make your face feel parched and uncomfortable. Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream come in generous 25 and 50 cent sizes. Try it for real shaving comfort. Thank you, Jim. And now, I'd like to go on with my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. Remember that scene you just heard? Well, one day a couple of months ago, I was in my office playing a bit of gin rummy with Herb Heidi, the bookie from the cigar store in the lobby, when Mr. J. McDonald called from the Great Western Insurance Company. I knew what he wanted. I'd read the morning papers. I hated to leave the game because uh, I was winning for some reason, known only to Herb Heidi who plays cards with all the warm human abandon of an adding machine. But I have learned to love a cash case like a bookie loves a losing horse, and uh, Great Western Insurance is a good client. So I picked up my $2.35 winnings and made tracks for the plush offices of Mr. J. McDonald. Sit down, Mr. Rogue. I have a case I want to discuss with you. Well, thank you. Uh, what's on the fire, Mr. McDonald? I suppose you read of the theft of the Somaliland diamond from the home of James E. Lee? Oh, sure, sure. Last night during a party given by his granddaughter, Sandra Lee. That much I know. Uh, Great Western had that diamond covered, Mr. Rogue. It was insured for $50,000. $50,000. No kidding. Mm, well, that's a lot of money. Must have been some diamond. We're offering $5,000 reward for the recovery of the stone. It's one of the largest in existence. Well, uh... Bring me up to date a little, will you? It was a slip crane job, wasn't it? The papers used his name. That's right. Three members of the family identified him from Rogue's Gallery Pictures. There's no doubt that he was the man. He had an accomplice, but we have no line on him at all. And all you want me to do is pinch Crane and get the uh, Somaliland diamond back, right? Yes. Crane left the Lee mansion in a yellow convertible sedan which the police found wrecked between the Lee estate and Los Angeles. There was blood on the seat, and it's thought that either Crane or his accomplice was wounded. They're believed to be here in the Los Angeles area. Huh? 
They haven't made any attempt to run the police blockade. Okay, Mr. McDonald, if he's here in this town, I'll have him. And that's all the information I have for you, Rogue. I've had our auditor make you out a check for $1,000. Oh? That's your retainer. Oh. And of course, if you do manage to recover the diamond, there will be another $4,000 due you. Oh, oh. Uh huh. Thanks. And here are your credentials, identifying you as our investigator. And now, Mr. Uh, Rogue. Remember, uh... I'm not promising anything. Oh, yes, there is one more thing. The Lee family has been extremely uncooperative today. Extremely so. They practically refuse to talk with either the newspapers or the police. Well, how do you figure that? I mean, uh, what do you suppose is their angle? That is what we are paying you to discover, Mr. Rogue. It was about five in the afternoon when I took off the Lee mansion which was a show place up the coast about 20 miles. Old man Lee is, uh, is an eccentric millionaire. His picture is always in the Rodegavir section with his two granddaughters, Sandra and Virginia, who live with him. A heavy fog billowed in about 10 minutes before I reached the Lee house, and drove, I drove the rest of the way by ear. And by the time I pulled up at the house, my windshield was colored like the side of a battleship and was just about as easy to see through. So I parked in the circular driveway and ran up on the huge front porch. Yes? Richard Rogue, uh, I want to see Mr. Lee, please. I'm sorry, Monsieur Lee is not in. Hmm. Well, then I'd like to see Miss Sandra Lee, then. I'm sorry, Miss Sandra is not in. Oh? Huh? Well, I'll just take a look. Oh, no, no, you cannot come in. Oh, you could be wrong, dear. There. Mm-hmm. I'm in. Who is it, Marie? This man is trying to force his way in, Monsieur Lee. Oh, good evening, Mr. Lee. I hope you remember me. Richard Rogue? Oh, the detective. Of course. Thank you very much, Marie. Come into the study, Mr. Rogue. I, uh, hope you don't think I'm a heathen walking in here like this, Mr. Lee. It's my business, you know. I... I had to see you. Oh, I suppose so. It's about that darn Somaliland diamond. I tell you, Mr. Rogue, we've just been pestered to death all day long about that robbery. I finally had to tell the police and the newspaper people to go away and let me alone. Well, I, I don't like to be a pest, but... Uh, oh, we have another guest, Sandra, my dear. The detective, Richard Rogue. Mr. Rogue, I'd like you to meet my granddaughter, Sandra Lee. We've met, Gramps. And, Mr. Rogue, I'd like to introduce you to John Wood. He's a house guest. I'm very happy to know you, Mr. Wood. Thank you. I suppose you're here to question us about the Somaliland diamond. Well, that's, uh, that's my job, Miss Lee. I suppose it is. Now, now, Sandra, please... Oh, my goodness. Oh, Graham, stop fidgeting. We're terribly tired of talking about the robbery, Mr. Rogue. We've talked to the police and reporters by the dozens, and, well, there's just not anything left to say. You must understand, Rogue, that Mr. Lee has been driven to the verge of a breakdown by this affair. Can't you give your information from the police? No, no, I can't. You know, I can see why you're tired of explaining what happened, but I'm in a little different position than the newspaper boys. I represent the insurance company, and... They had that diamond covered for $50,000, and naturally, they're quite interested in knowing the facts of the case. I assure you, Mr. Rogue, that I have no intention of filing a claim against the insurance company. Oh? No intention at all. I just don't want to hear any more about the diamond or the robbery. But, Mr. Lee, isn't... Oh, please, it... Mr. Rogue. It's Graham's own business if he wants to take the loss, isn't it? Well, yes, yeah, I suppose it is, but it's a little unusual. And I don't think he should make any such decision under the present circumstances. It's easy to see that you're all upset and jittery, but... Uh, and with good I... reason, really, Mr. Rogue. Mr. Lee has not been well. Couldn't you talk with him tomorrow? No. I'm, uh, I'm sure you won't mind, Mr. Lee, if I have a chair here in front of the fireplace. It's... No. Well, it's a terrible night out. Had a tough drive the last few miles. Fog is awful. Yes, I have noticed that the fog is in a little heavier than usual tonight. It's depressing, isn't it? Fog on top of everything else. Oh, Mr. Rogue, I'm so upset. Maybe you'd better start back to town, Mr. Rogue. It'll be slow going in this fog. What's the matter with you, Miss Lee? You're not the hysterical type. Will you please leave, Mr. Rogue? No. I'm an investigator, and I've got a job to do. I'd be a lousy investigator if I didn't try to get to the bottom of this situation. Who are you protecting? What are you afraid of? Are you accusing us of complicity in the disappearance of that diamond? I don't even know you, Mr. Wood. I'm talking to the Lees. I'm not accusing them of anything. Look, Mr. Lee, crime is my business. I know how to deal with crime and criminals. Why don't you tell me what's on your mind, Mr. Lee? I'm sorry, Mr. Rogue. 
But as far as I and, and my family are concerned, the theft of the Somaliland diamond is a closed matter. I have my reasons now. Please go. Yes, you... You can't do any good staying here. Where's your other granddaughter, Mr. Lee? Where's Virginia? She's returned to her school in the city. Oh, I see. Oh, Graham, please, make now, it clean. Now, now, dear. I'm sure Mr. Rogue will be going. Did you ring, monsieur? Yes, Marie. Will you please show Mr. Rogue to the door? Okay, okay, okay. But uh, if you ever feel like you need any help in whatever it is that's forcing you to act like this, Mr. Lee, call me, will you? I'll be waiting for your call. Yes. Yes, I will. I'm sorry, Mr. Rogue. Good night. Good night. Good night, Miss Lee and Mr. Wood. Good night. Good night. This way, monsieur. Monsieur Rogue, you are the detective? Yes, that's right. There are strange things going on in this house, Monsieur Rogue. There is much trouble. Yeah? Can you tell me about it, Marie? Oh, well, I... Marie! Uh, yes, Monsieur Wood? Mr. Lee wants to see you in the library. Good night, Mr. Rogue. As I got in my car and sneaked down the hill through the fog, I told myself I was wasting my time. That I was looking for a man named Slip Crane, the jewel thief. And that I had no business getting mixed up in the family affairs of the Lees. <laughs> There was a filling station and general store at the spot where the highway joined the private road that led up to the Lee estate. Sam's filling station for you and your car. I stopped in there for a sandwich and a cup of coffee. Great night to be driving around, mister. Yeah, yeah, it is. Hey, uh, give me a slice of that pumpkin pie, will you? Why, sure. Here you are. Just came down the hill from the Lee house, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, sir, there was plenty of excitement around here last night. Yep. Cops all over the place. Newspaper men. Best business have done in years. The whole district is still full of cops. They've thrown up a roadblock in every direction. Hey, you policeman? That for a fashion. You working on the case? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That must have been some diamond. Mm. You know, those Lees are nice people. The old man's a little fidgety, but the rest of them are swell people. Well, he's all right, too. Yes, sir, nice guy. You know them? Know them? Why, sure know them. Known them all for years. The kids, Sandra, Virginia, been eating my hamburgers ever since they was old enough to toddle down here. Yeah? You know what school Virginia goes to up in the city? Why, sure. Same one Sandra used to go to. Hmm. Uh, let me see, uh, Mrs. Whipple School. Oh, well, thanks. Hey, uh, what's the toll charge to call the city? Uh, two bits for the first three minutes. There's a phone booth right over there. Thank you. Yes, sir, those little Lee girls are the salt of the earth. I've known them for ten years, I guess. Knew their daddy well, too. Went to school with him. He's a colonel now, an eagle colonel in Washington. A big shot. Hello, operator. Please get me Briargate 63645 in the city. Oh, hello. I, uh, I would like to speak with Virginia Lee, please. Miss Lee? Why, well, I'm sure she isn't here. She's at her grandfather's home up the coast. Oh, she is? Are you sure? Oh, yes. Uh, just a minute. Miss Lee is home, isn't she? Uh, yes. Miss Lee is not expected back until Monday morning. Thank you. Get your party? Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, give me another cup of coffee, will you, Sam? Why, sure. Oh, uh, tell me, Sam, uh... I know the whole Lee family, except Virginia. She's only about 14, isn't she? Jenny? Oh, no. No, she's 19 to 20. Mm. 20, I think. She's a wild one, that youngster. She's all for having fun. Nothing at all like her sister, Sandra. Oh. Well, I guess I'll be on my way. Can't sit here all night. I don't envy your drive, none. Better take it easy in that fog. <laughs> It was all as plain as a nose on an anteater's face now. They told me Virginia was back at her school. She wasn't. Sam told me Virginia was a wild one. I knew Slip Crane. He was a smoothie. So one and one makes two, and these two were Virginia Lee and Slip Crane. 
she'd run away with him. That's why the old man didn't want the case followed any further. That's why he was willing to take the loss rather than have the police arrest his daughter with Slip Crane when they caught him for the theft of the Somaliland diamond. I got in my jalopy and drove back to the Lee estate. I wanted to have a talk with that maid, Marie. I parked at the turn in the driveway and walked through the fog toward the servant's cottage at the rear of the main house. I could see a halo of light back there pointing its fingers through the haze. I headed for it across the lawn. I heard a movement behind me and then... Oh. Oh, I caught my dream train for Cloud 8. And who was waiting for me there was my alter enemy, Yugor. <laughs> In trouble again, eh, Rogi? What happened, midget? <laughs> you got hit on the head. <laughs> As usual. Uh, who hit me? I didn't see them. <laughs> it's a wonder you've lived so long, Rogi. Dumb as you are. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It was a Dane that hit me, wasn't it? <laughs> was it? I remember the perfume. I remember getting a sniff of it just as you let me have it. <laughs> That's you, Chief. Sniffing when you should have been ducking. <laughs> oh, ooh, my head. Oh, you'd think I'd get used to this, but I, I don't, do I? <laughs> you know, Rogie, you haven't time to talk with me tonight. Get back downstairs. <laughs> oh, just let me rest a while, will you? Oh! Please, don't push me, please. I'm tired. Over you go. Come on. You got some trouble to straighten up down there. Over you go. Over the side. Look out. Look out. Oh, here I go again. I began to come to. I could hear voices fading in and out. I couldn't focus my mind's eye on them, but I listened without quite knowing what it was all about. Oh, oh, Mr. Rogue. Please, please, wake up. Sandra, don't move. I see you and I have you covered. All right. I'm not moving, Mr. Wood. What are you doing? Who's that lying there? It's Richard Rogue, the detective. Oh? Rogue, huh? What happened to him? I, I knocked him out with this poker. I thought he was you. You followed me when I left the house, huh? Yes. I was going to try to kill you. Really? How interesting. Instead of that, you fixed it, so I'll have to kill Richard Rogue. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you that one of Hollywood's foremost hairstylists remarked recently that most women do not shampoo their hair often enough. She pointed out that movie stars' hair is frequently shampooed every day because they know that beautiful hair must be kept sparkling clean at all times. Now, you're probably thinking, isn't it hard on hair to wash it so often? Doesn't it become dry and difficult to manage? The answer is no, not if you use Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo. Thousands of women in the United States and Canada have found they can wash their hair as often as they like with this shampoo, and their hair is always soft lustrous and easy to set. Fitch's saponified shampoo does not dry the hair because it's made from mild coconut and vegetable oils. These pure natural oils are kind to your hair. It makes swirls of rich, fragrant lather that rinses out completely, for Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. Just rinse with plain water, and the rinsing agent goes to work to remove all remaining particles from your hair leaving it soft and full of natural highlights. You can get a generous six-ounce bottle of Fitch's saponified shampoo for 50 cents and the economical 16-ounce size for one dollar. Use it often to keep your hair shining and lovely. Now back to Rogue's Gallery. Richard Rogue is telling our story. I was telling you about the time the Somaliland diamond was stolen from the home of wealthy old gem collector James E. Lee. The insurance company put me on the case, and I went out to Lee's secluded country mansion, but uh, got no place. He wouldn't even talk to me about the robbery. I left, uh, picked up a few more clues, and returned. 
I was walking across the lawn in a pea soup fog when I was knocked unconscious by Sandra Lee, the old man's granddaughter. And when I returned to consciousness, I... I played possum and listened to the conversation between Sandra and uh, John Wood, a mysterious house guest of the Lees. So you followed me when I left the house, huh? Yes. I was going to try to kill you. Instead of that, you fixed it so I have to kill Rogue. Do you think that would be smart? He doesn't know anything. No? Come on, help me carry him into the house. There's a certain permanence about being killed that made me act deader than a ghost town on Monday night. I was as limp as a wet sock when they picked me up and carried me into the house. Wood, who was a very strange house guest, lifted the rod out of my shoulder holster before they laid me out on the divan in the study. Old Mr. Lee was very upset when he saw me. He, he immediately started patting my hands while Wood poured some very good brandy down my throat. I was in no hurry to face facts, but eventually I figured that one more sip of brandy would be overdoing it, so I snapped out of it. He's coming out of it. Oh, mm. oh what happened to me? Oh, my head. Oh, dear, I knew something like this would happen. Oh. I hit you. I didn't know who you were. You should know better than to be caught prowling around the lawn up here after what happened last night. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you're right. Uh, what did you hit me with? A poker. Oh, Sandra. I don't know what your father would say. What were you doing on the lawn at this time of night, Rogue? You're lucky you didn't get shot, you know that? Yeah, yeah, I suppose I am. Oh, well, I, I didn't think of that. Uh, could I have another drink of that brandy? It makes me forget my headache. Of course, Mr. Rogue. Uh, here you are. Uh, thanks, yeah. <sighs> yeah. <clears throat> oh, that's uh, strong. And You know, Mr. Lee, I, I came back to tell you... Uh, I've got the deal figured. What do you mean? I mean, well, Mr. Lee, you told me that your other granddaughter, Virginia, had gone gone back to her school. Yes. I called Mrs. Whipple's school and found out she wasn't due back until Monday. Yes? Oh, you called the school? She wasn't there? That's right. So right away, I knew why you were so anxious to get me to drop the case today. You've got it all figured out, haven't you, Rogue? Sure. I'm right, aren't I? Virginia, your granddaughter eloped with the thief. That's right, isn't it, Mr. Lee? I, uh... Guess we might as well admit it to you, Rogue. Nothing else we can do. Is there, Mr. Lee? No, I, I guess not. Now, that's not for publication, you know, Rogue. We'll make it worth your while to forget it. Won't we, Mr. Lee? Why, of course. If you say so, Mr. Wood, I it, mean... Uh, it'll cost you. Uh, I'm not in business for my health. For a thousand bucks, I forget what I know. That would be satisfactory. <laughs> You're something of a louse, aren't you, Rogue? <laughs> something. You can call me a louse if you'll give me that grand... You got that much in the house, Mr. Lee? I believe I have, in the safe. You want me to get it for you, Gramps? We might as well get Mr. Rogue paid off and out of here. Now, that's the kind of talk I like to hear. Yes, Sandra. Will you get it for me, dear? So that's what you came back for, the shakedown. <laughs> you private dicks are all alike. <laughs> For the first time since I'd been carried into the house, Wood was loosening up. My attempt at a shakedown had sold him on the fact that I was just a chiseler. And I could see the hand he had on that gun in his coat pocket relax a little. That brandy had given me a transfusion and I was feeling all of my faculties falling back into place. I was tense as the E string on a Heifetz fiddle and just as ready to play when I saw Sandra sneak in the door and grab up that poker she'd used so effectively on me. I figured it was my move, so I started to get up. I wanted to get Wood concentrating on me. Oh, you know, you know, I have, I think I've got a concussion. My, my head is spinning like a top. Look, uh, is his skin broken, Wood? I don't know, and I don't care. Well, you could look, can't you? Come here. Better take it easy, Rogue. You're in no shape to make any sudden moves. No, I, I just want to see if I can sit up. That's all. Now, look out. Take it, Sandra. I've got his gun arm. Let go of that. Ooh. Oh, nice work, Sandra. Get his gun? Sure. He's got one of mine, too, that I want back. Sandra, how could you dare with Virginia? I had to do it, Graham. Give me a belt, will you, Mr. Lee? I want to use it to tie up this character's legs. He's one of the men who stole my diamond. He was with that crane man. They worked together. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm still a little confused. Sandra. Yes? Give me a handkerchief, will you? I want to gag our friend. Incidentally... 
I was conscious when you explained to him that you knocked me silly by mistake. Please, we must get to Virginia. Poor Virginia. We will, Gramps, we will. Just leave it to us. Where is Virginia? She's upstairs, with Crane holding a gun on her. Hmm? She's been up there ever since five this morning. What? Well, here, here. Fill it in a little. What happened? These men came back here last I'll night, Miss... Uh, you mean Crane and Wood robbed you and then came back here and hid up after they wrecked their car and couldn't get through the police blockade? Yes. Crane was wounded. They waited until the police were gone about five this morning, then they came in. Hmm. They kidnapped Virginia and held her in a room. Crane stayed with her and Wood made us introduce him to the police and newspaper men all morning. Okay. A house guest. Okay, okay. Now, this guy's all taken care of. Let's go get Crane. Where is he? He's in one of the front suites, upstairs. In a room that has windows out onto the porch? Yes, um, the first window at this end of the porch. All right, now listen. In exactly five minutes, you knock on the door to that room, right? This sounds dangerous. I shinned up the pillar at the far end of the porch, looked my rod over to see that it was in good working order, and... Then I inched over to the window of the room where Crane was holding Virginia. Virginia was tied in a chair. Crane was babying a bloody shoulder. I could hear them talking. Oh, I'd like to get my hands on that cop that got me in the shoulder last night. Too bad it was through the shoulder, Mr. Crane. It should have been through your heart. You know, I like you. I like my women with a lot of spirit. I may just take you with me when I make my break from here. You'll have to kill me first. Oh, huh. company. Come in and keep your hands right on that tray. I'd hate to have to shoot a beautiful girl like you. I brought up some coffee. That's thoughtful of you. Keep your hands in the air and stay away from me. Don't take any chances, Sandra. This fiend would rather shoot you than not. Drop that gun, Crane. My next shot goes right through your back collar button. Well, he dropped it. And that's about the end of the story, except that I took the uh, Somaliland diamond from him and won the five grand reward, which I, uh, which I spent on Sandra Lee during the next few months. I thought some of asking her to marry me. And believe me, I, I think she was all in the mood to give her the nod. No, no, really, really. But I thought better of it and stayed single, making me one of those select eligible young men who has never made the same mistake once. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Did you uh, miss the murder in tonight's story, or do you think we can get along without one once in a while? Ray Buffum wrote tonight's yarn. Leith Stevens composed, composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed don't forget to tune in again next Thursday night. We're going to present an exact story about a horse, a jockey, and a murder. We call it The Last Race. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. Uh, oh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And as I was saying, don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug and toilet goods counter, barber, or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H.